So I, uh, the scene was started with the opening the uh, motion capture preset that you can find in my installation folder and it's a quite long piece of animation like uh, about 260 frames long and uh, what I did first is uh, selected the the uh, rigged uh, geometry and then I went to pipeline cache alembic and export selection to alembic I accepted the default settings and saved the baked animation to the hard drive. Before I exported the geometry, I made sure that there are no overlapping UVs. So I had to um, um, UV edit it. I did a quite a uh, quite simple I took a quite simple approach I used under polygon uh, create UVs and automatic mapping option was quite uh, sufficient for me and um, um, after all the UVs were were laid down properly um, I went ahead and exported it as a alembic. After the geometry was baked onto the hard drive, I reset the scene to file new scene, went to pipeline, cache, alembic, import alembic, and pointed to uh, to the hard drive location where the alembic file was saved, and as a result of this simple procedure, I ended up with a, a, a very simple geometry representation. I call this geometry as a denser. And then I used a tool that we wrote in a previous Python class to bake a texture into the um, the speed texture into the uh, in, uh, image sequence and um, if I o o go to the um, uh, source images and the speed texture you would see that I generated uh, uh, let's say 264 263 um, frames or uh, where each frame corresponds to a uh, frame number and if I would to want to display this thing here I would just uh, might want to open um, uh, this image sequence in um, After Effects for example, and if I play back it, we would see this type of things where um, each, uh, like uh, the white value, uh, corresponds to the piece of geometry that move in faster than order. And then I opened Hypershade, created a simple Lambert material assign that Lambert material to the object and um, I selected um, um, an attribute editor I clicked on a color swatch here and created a file texture and pointed to the the uh, dialog box like this to the place where the image texture was saved. I selected the file and I checked the use image sequence. Then I switched the view to sh texture view 
and now I'm able to see that that texture in um, in OpenGL Vbird. Now that it's a really valuable experience seeing the texture in OpenGL Vbird, it's just to make sure that the frames are read and the texture is available. Then I went and go went ahead and created the fluid container. So as you probably already um, realize, the reason I brought the baked speed texture into the scene is to use it to drive a fluid simulator, fluid emission. The purpose of the speed texture was to emit more fluid, more density, more fuel, more temperature from that part of the geometry that moves fast. So for example, as, uh, as his arm moves through the air fast, it would emit more temperature and more density and more fuel into the fluid container while that part of the body that uh, is not moving much would emit less. This way we would avoid a situation where there are a lot of fire or a lot of smoke emitted from an um, area of the geometry that is not moving much that potentially could produce a unstable fluid simulation later. Um, then I would, as I mentioned, go ahead and create a 3D container. I would place a container somewhere around the bounding box of the animation and the, the, the way I do it I go to top view I, I press alt B to change the color of the of the viewport and then I would create a cube polygon cube would work and I just would scale it up like this. And I go to the first frame of simulation and I kind of eyeball the area where the guy is moving. So I would move it some somewhere close enough to like, for example, as he advances to the left, I would position the the polygon cube to that area and then I try to figure out how much to the left or screen left the denser moves and I position it just to cover that area here and this box this polygon cube I would be using as a visual template to position a fluid container later so I can see, so let's limit the frame range to 150 instead of like to 260. And I would scroll down and I would see that along the negative Z axis, it does not m move as much to have it kind of square. So I would, instead of scaling, I might want just to select the vertices and move the box vertices just to be around that area. So this area is not really used. I might want to just uh, move it just around his feet, foot. And now, like from a top view, it looks like he's almost always within the boundaries of the 
of this box which uh, once again I'm going to be using to to position a fluid container later so now I switch to orthographic view front view and do the same thing from a front view and since like he's always remains to be on a plane then or, or on the floor plane I would go ahead and move the the floor line somewhere where his feet touch the ground and to have a uh, enough ceiling room I would give it a space probably more than in any other exits just because the smoke or fire tend to rise up in that direction more than any other directions <clears throat> so now when I have a visual representation of where the fluid container needs to be I can go ahead and create a co fluid container and now I just uh, instead of manipulating fluid container and scrolling back animation I just uh, would achieve the same result much quicker so I change the size of the container to be the size of the polygon representation and I go to orthographic view front view and we can see that red line represent X axis I can change it here in the attribute editor to be in for example 32 so that's close enough maybe if I want to be perfect it would be 33 and along Y axis is probably another four units maybe 35 and now I switch to top view and change the Z axis and that would be probably as much as 40 so now when the size of the container is known I need to I, I save that file as it is just the size and position and now I need to make a decision what resolution I would be working with and it's quite an important step because because it will affect the final output or final result of the simulation I prefer to work with a consistent resolution instead of like working with the low resolution version of the simulation and then progressively increasing it because every time you up-press a fluid container it changes the simulation and the the larger the difference between low resolution version of the container and high resolution version of the container the more impact it makes on the difference of the simulation itself so you might want to get involved into the situation when you change the fluid attribute or simulation attributes too too often wasting your time and resources so when the size is known <clears throat> I now need to figure out what maximum resolution I can afford utilizing uh, available CPU uh, taking into the account capabilities of the machine and such I most often would use the maximum resources I have so um, for this particular box I have here I know that I could go quite high in the resolution settings <clears throat> 
And if I would go ahead and type the high numbers into resolution field, it, it will slow down my performance a lot. But I, <clears throat> and changing the settings of the resolution while the container is alive may take quite a long time. I mean, up to 15, 20, 30 minutes sometimes. In order to speed up the resolution changes settings, I would go and turn off all the grids. When you turn them off, the change of resolution happens almost instantly. So, for example, if I would type 3, if I multiply the size of the container by 10, I would get consistent, uniform, square voxels along every container direction. So 33 multiplied by 10 is 330. This would result to 350. And this would result to 420. That's a, that's a quite a large resolution already to have. In order to speed up the viewport redraw, I would absolutely turn particles off because they they never useful while testing a simulation or at least their representation. But they do slow down wire view display quite dramatically. And then Bounding draw, I would change to bounding box. There's no need to display such a dense voxel representation. So now I have a quite kind of medium resolution container in my scene. And I know that the size of the container is quite sufficient for this animation. But uh, looking at these numbers, and from experience, I know that there is quite a room left to increase this even higher. There is a limitation of how much resolution the fluid container can have, and this limitation comes from the fact that the fluid cache can only ha be 2 gigabytes per frame. The size of the fluid cache would change based on the decision you make whether you want to cache velocity, density, temperature, or fuel. If you would cache all the four fields together and all of them will be saved into the same cache file, the file cache would size will grow significantly faster if you would just cache uh, density than most of the time used for the rendering. So I know that if I would cache a density only, then in order to be within 2 gigabyte cache file size limit, I probably would be able to go with the resolution that twice as much as I have right now. So I would say the maximum resolution for the fluid container in Maya using density only for cache would be around, like, say, 660. It will warn me that I'm playing with extremely high numbers. And this guy here would be probably 840. So this number that we see here is practically absolute maximum we can deal while running simulation inside of Maya. So this size 
is a is a size that kind of optimized to keep the guy inside of the fluid container within the fr frame range and this particular resolution is about the as high as we can get so now if I turn all the um, fields on and start play blast in this simulation it would take tremendous amount of time and um, feedback time from a simulation would be quite slow meaning we would have to wait for each frame to advance uh, through the timeline in very slow pace making this experience extremely inefficient and boring so in order to get the speed from a simulation and yet <clears throat> seeing the same result of the high fidelity or high resolution simulation I would instead of changing the resolution change the size with the resolution so for example knowing size and the resolution relationship here I know that the relationship between the size and the resolution is multiplier of 20 so if I would change the size to for example 5 by 5 by 5 that's a little teeny but if I would multiply it by 4 by 20 that would be the same output resolution of the container that was when it was large but if I would play blast or run simulation now I would be able to see much more of the within shorter period of time meaning like it would take significantly less time to simulate container of this size while the voxel size if I would display a voxel the voxel size is the consistently the same when the container was larger and having much larger resolution so the concept behind of this approach is to have the same voxel size in world units regardless of the size of the container you change this container you change the resolution and such in opposite vice versa so if I turn bounding box representation like that back to the simple box and now this container appears to be way too small so now I would go and change let's say give it a little bit larger number like 10 by 10 by 10 and 200 by 200 by 200 if you're using like a 16 or 24 core machine or better yet 32 core machine then working with the resolution up to 300 in every direction would give you uh, practically instant feedback anything higher than 300 will slow down the machine so I can with multiplier of 20 as a relationship number between size and resolution I can go with number 15 for this size and apparently I would need to increase the resolution to 300 but I know that 300 for 16 core or 24 core or 32 core machine is quite affordable so with this size of container I'm able to start simulation and get the uh, feedback from simulation quite fast sometimes I start to save voxels by decreasing for example one of the axes so I know that for example within first 20-40 frames the 
the dancer is not moving much along x axis it, or it's moving constantly along one plane so from a top view I can see it moves along z axis while being consistent along x so that's why if I display the fluid container back that's why I might want to reduce uh, x size of the container to be smaller than the size along the z axis and utilizing those available voxels that I gave up from a x axis and give it for example to z axis so now I can increase the size of the container along the z axis sometimes it makes um, sense to even rotate the container to position it along the travel of the of the animation of the character sometimes I would work only on the upper body part and then on the lower or I might want to work only on the arm or on the head depending like on the animation and such but the goal is to keep the voxel size the same while having fluid container resolution Uh, optimized for fast feedback and that that's a generic approach I take 95% of the time while working on on a, with the fluid dynamics um, I can recall a single time when I would use a, anything different like I might sometimes while working with high resolution container like this just like before doing a final um, simulation baking in the f fluid cache I would want to go ahead and increase the fluid resolution container by another 10% just because I realized that there is another 10% that I could get but from the beginning to the end I practically know what the fluid resolution needs to be as we demonstrated with this example so now I can delete this container because it was used only to show the, the concept of sizing and resizing the container as you already noticed from my outliner I have a fluid container here and let's display it so that's a fluid container that we we see here in a, in this rendering uh, this is the same container that 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 was used to to uh, run simulation and as you can see the box that we created during this recording is pretty close to size of the container I end up with uh, so I can probably delete that polygon box because there's no need and let's take a look at the settings that I have for this particular example is um, it's got resolution 510 by 450 by 600 and it's uh, 34 by 30 by 40 and this file I will upload to FTP, FXPHD FTP for you to download so you would be able to uh, play with that with this preset. As you notice it's a density, velocity, temperature and fuel is on and geometry itself I, uh, after the fluid container was created I selected geometry I selected fluid container and I went fluid effect and say add edit content and I selected emitter if I do this it will 
create um, select fluid effects emit from object sorry and I say apply and when I do that you can see that the new emitter is being created and it's been parented under the geometry then I would go select the fluid emitter that I just created first it was the first emitter and I set the density emission to 1 at the beginning and then the hit velocity to 2 multiplied by 2 and then for the fuel I set it to 4 so this is kind of recommended method of setting up initial uh, emission for the density heat and a fuel so where heat is twice as much as the density and the fuel is much as twice as much as the heat so one two four and then every time you change this number if for example you want to increase it you multiply it by two so two and then four and then eight and uh, apparently from the beginning before you play blast anything you're not able to make a right decision what number needs to be typed in here so the only way to verify what whether number works or not is to switch to shaded viewport by pressing 5 and play blast or you might want to go ahead instead of play blasting going to rendering and render it with Maya or mental ray since you're not caching to the drive and you're rendering from a first frame of a simulation make sure that the first frame of rendering that you specified here start frame is equal or less to the first frame of simulation that is being specified as, as a start frame of the fluid simulation if your start frame for the rendering happen to be larger than the start frame of the simulation then rendering that the simulation is about to produce will be probably invalid uh, now when I play blasted or rendered few tests of this guy moving inside of the fluid container and emitting uh, fluid density temperature and fuel I noticed quite few artifacts and they mostly were related to the fact that geometry was moving way too fast producing a stairs artifact so if I go to front view sorry side view and I select a container go to display outline now we can see the size of the voxels that were used for the simulation I zoom in to his foot and I advance one frame ahead and you can see that in one single frame the geometry travels far enough to skip two frames in be uh, several voxels in between so if I take this piece of geometry and I duplicate it so I practically froze it and I go back one frame I can see the animation of this guy in two frames before and after and you can see this distance here those voxels they would never be taken into the account during simulation meaning like on frame 37 
the fluid density, temperature, and fuel will be emitted only into those voxels. On the next frame, number 38, the emission will happen within those voxels and nothing in between. So to, to solve this issue with the stereo, um, let me turn the bounding box again. Uh, to solve this issue, I would go to fluid emitter properties. That's a duplicated guide that we just used to show position of the geometry in the previous frame. I select the fluid emitter and under the fluid emitter there is a checkbox called motion streak. And this option would be used to instruct fluid emitter to emit the content such as a density, a temperature, and fuel along its motion vector. So the fluid, w fluid emitter will do its best to try to fuel all the voxels in between the frames the geometry travels. Under basic emitter attributes, there is another option called max distance. And this option works in unison with motion streak. See if I click and unclick, this guy gets grayed out. Max distance. And that attribute is often overlooked and becomes kind of obscured or hidden just because it's not even in the same area of the attribute editor. It would make total sense to move this max distance attribute to reside next to the motion streak checkbox because most of the time it's closed you're not even able to see it and I actually found this attribute by accident while trying to solve the issue that I worked on where it was emitting too much of the so mo Depending on the speed of the object or the speed of the <clears throat> the length of the velocity vector as well as the size of the container in a world unit and the size of the geometry in a world unit, the motion streak checkbox would have a either more pronounced impact on simulation or less pronounced. As we could imagine, the faster the object moves or the smaller the fluid container is, the motion streak would have a much more impact uh, comparing to slow moving object that emits much less, <clears throat> that's got much less velocity and on a larger fluid container and the larger objects. <clears throat> so this max distance attribute is actually an attribute that you would be using to control how much the fluid emitter would feel the distance along the motion vector. <clears throat> that checkbox motion streak along with the max distance attribute solved the issue with the stairs quite good I mean it was a quite successful you can see it here in 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 this rendering as a uh, as he moves his head you still able to see it. there are some probably quite noticeable but almost unnoticeable with motion blur and such, if I play around with the additional post effects, you can get rid of the, any possible artifacts. But without this motion streak, you would, the simulation would look terrible. It would 
one frame you would have a fireball here another frame next frame it's here and nothing black hole in between so motion streak definitely help fight that issue but then for the final result it was not satisfactory in order to nail this problem down and completely eliminate any artifacts I had to use sub steps and um, if you select the fluid container under dynamics properties if I turn it on when we need to turn it on in order to be able to see them this attribute called sub steps and it's a similar sub step attribute that we see in the particles that means like a simulation will be evaluated five times in between the each frame so making it practically five times slower by the way too to simulate you don't if possible you don't want to use this sub steps attribute just because it slows down simulation so much but it definitely smooths out the the any fast moving object artifacts so once again for fast moving guy like this the sub steps along with the motion streak checkbox along with the uh, max distance attribute be careful with this max distance attribute if you give it too high number and it's very sensitive it will explode the simulation so i found that 0 0.2 0 0.4 works pretty well i was never able to get reliable stable simulation with the number higher than 0.5 or even 0.4 for the density heat emission and the fuel emission if I select go to windows hypershade you would see that I use the same file texture so what I did I selected that file node that I pointed to read the um, speed texture that was generated by that tool that we wrote last class. The same texture that I assigned to the Lambert material and we previewed in an OpenGL viewport, the same attribute, I mean the same file I used to plug as a texture driven emission for the density heat and fuel so as we could imagine the white area of the animated texture would emit more density heat and fuel and the black value would result in none in grayscale value would somewhere in between but once again the white values are being used as a multiplier against the number that you type into the field here and since those values here given a uh, given per second meaning like it's not per frame right so the whatever happening within the texture animation is being slow down by dividing it 24 frames per second so even if texture turns black cons constant black in one single frame doesn't mean it will stop emitting immediately it will take 24 frames to completely stop emission so it's important to realize that many attributes in a emitter works per second not per frame if you want to get a number that works per frame you need to 
get the number and divide it by 24 and type it in. Same applies to the particles, by the way. All right, so now, in order to create the complexity to the texture, I created a fractal procedural texture that available in Maya. You can go to 2D textures, and there are tons of, not tons, but quite a lot available. And um, as you probably know, the procedural textures are good because they they don't take uh, much of disk space and they resolution independent, meaning like they never show pixelation. Even while here in a thumbnail view in a hypershade, they do appear kind of pixelated in those swatches during render time, they are always in infinitely smooth. And um, I put a real simple linear um, curve. If I go to animation editor, graph editor, I would be able to see it here. And I say infinity, show infinity. And you can see that by selecting this guy and going to post infinity to linear, pre infinity to linear, meaning like the time of this texture is being animated. So it's not the same pattern on every frame, it's, it shifts over time slowly. And then I selected my file texture node. And under color balance, there is a attribute called color offset. And I just click the fractal and plug it there. Sometimes, sorry, it's color gain instead of color offset. So what color gain does, it multiplies the content of the file texture against whatever is being plugged into the color gain swatch. So result of this simple connection is that the texture that was created by running that generate speed texture tool is being multiplied against the procedural fractal noise, breaking up the simplicity of those white areas that we saw. Um, I hope that it will show this result in here, but OpenGL viewport is not really good in showing this nicely. And of course we can go to to combine text here and say highest open extra attributes under the Lambert and type 512 for resolution of the texture sometimes it's approved the look or you might want to go in 1024 for example it will slow down the OpenGL viewport significantly and With that being done, when texture was connected to the density, heat, and a fuel emission, I start to run simulation and see the result as a uh, working with the smaller size container, but having the same voxel size all the time. And depending on what I saw, I was start to play with these numbers here, eventually end up with the numbers that you got when I opened this file. Within the fluid container itself, aside from changing the, uh, all the grids to dynamics, I put the high detail solve to all grids sub steps sub steps as i mentioned was set to five 
simulation rate to one. Um, as I already mentioned before that I kind of like working with a simulation rate of three, but for the fire I noticed it makes a quite nicer look when it moves a little bit slow. The slower it moves, the more elegant look it got. In the content detail under density, you see that I set buoyancy to 9 and the gravity to 9. And the reason is, is because, because the fire needs this kind of upward motion. It needs to rise quite fast. Uh, that's a nature of the fire is that comparing to a smoke it it escapes the emitter and moves with the uh, with the air and atmosphere up quite fast and that's kind of a look that we get used to when we see the fire so upward motion fast upward motion is practically mandatory for for the fire to look realistic. Dissipation is set to four, which is a uh, four times higher than default maximum value, meaning like it's extremely high number for dissipation. And once again the reason for the high dissipation value is because for the shading, for the rendering, the the density used as a opacity ramp. So instead of using a temperature to drive what is renderable, because this ramp here, the opacity ramp, is what makes f smoke or fire or whatever fluid you render visible. That what shapes representation. You would achieve similar look by switching to temperature but depending what attributes you set for the temperature for example if you would use a diffusion and I do use diffusion and diffusion as you remember is the number that control control the blurriness of the simulation then the with diffusion set to non-zero you might get blurry edges here and it's not something you would be probably happy trying to get the 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 look of the fire such and um for the temperature same numbers the, the, as you can see I I try to avoid using all the diffusion pressure and all these additional things because by my opinion only buoyancy works in a physically accurate algorithm everything else are kind of brutal force approach for shaping your simulation. Diffusion for the temperature when used when used s with the small numbers is quite friendly and helpful. I would never use diffusion for the density, the grid that is being used to for rendering, but for the temperature very small diffusion numbers and once again when we render this container since we set the opacity ramp to use a density grid we're not really seeing temperature so any blurriness or any artifacts that we use any tricks that we use to drive temperature grid is not going to be seen during the render time so that's quite forgivable in this particular setup to start using those numbers here because uh, with this particular setup temperature grid is used for nothing else to drive a density that remains to be razor sharp during a simulation 
because it does not diffuse within the fluid container. For the chain, it is a temperature and the color is black. That's it, and uh, the rest of the no texturing was used, shading quality to smooth as always, because uh, default linear would produce a, could produce a artifacts. And as a last step, when I was quite happy with the simulation, I, I, I kind of wanted to uh, this piece of geometry to contribute to velocity within the within the fluid container. Of course, I could go ahead select the fluid emitter that I had used for the density, heat, and a fuel emission. I could go ahead and turn speed emission to add, which I did in this particular case. But the number that I dial here kind of was interfering to what I to what I was getting with the motion streaks. So in order to be able to control the the fluid emission, uh, the speed into the fluid, I created another fluid emitter, and this time I set up the density and all other emissions to zero, other than velocity. So this second fluid emitter was used for nothing but the speed emission or velocity emission. That gave me a little flexibility of shaping velocity emission within the fluid container independently on the content of the of the emission of the uh, density and, and a hit and fuel. And um, let me as a last ju just to make sure that the fuel attributes as you can see that the reaction speed for the fuel is set to be quite for the fuel is set to be quite low meaning like I try to make fuel travel as much as possible through the fluid container before it completely becomes a temperature the error fuel ratio was set to 15 and according to documentation that's a temperature I mean this is a ratio that uh, we typically find in gasoline and such playing with different numbers I notice a little difference between 0 and 15 for example so I would say even if you would disregard this air fuel ratio it wouldn't make a big difference on a simulation itself heat releases I left at 1 and this is probably the same as changing the the emission attribute the attribute found under emitter all right so i will be uploading this file on um, as i said on the site please open run change the settings and see how it works and next class we will try to improve the look of the simulation and play with the shading uh, working with the simulation that already cached so we would be able to uh, do real-time shading and possibly bring the particles into the game let's say or maybe we want to jump to another practical example because that's something that many people would like to see less of theory or and more of the practical examples.
So let's see how we happy with this example and move on to the next. I see you next week.